Gopi Janavala Pha Girivaradhari Jaya Gopi Janavala Pha Girivaradhari Yashoda Nandana Brajajana Ranjana Yashoda Nandana Brajajana Ranjana Jamuna Tira Vanachari Jamuna Tira Vanachari Jaya Radha Madhava Kunja Bihari Jaya Radha Madhava Kunja Bihari Jai. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Today is Tuesday, November 7th, 2023. I am Jai Sri Radha Devi Dasi, and we are reading from Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 2, The Cosmic Manifestation, Chapter 6, Purusha Shukta Confirmed. And today we're going to read text 11 through 16, focusing on text 11. So you can um, turn to your devices if you um, want to. And in the meantime, I'm going to um, say some prayers to our spiritual teachers. Om Magyana Tabaranda Shya Jana Jana Shalakaya Chakshunumitam Jaina Tasmai Shri Guru Namaha. I was born in the darkest ignorance, and my spiritual master opened my eyes with the torch of knowledge. I offer my respectful obeisances unto him. Shri Chaitanya Manovistam Stapitam Jena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadamayam Tadatvit Swa Padantikam. When will Srila Rupa Goswami Prabhupada, who was established within this material world, the mission to fulfill the desire of Lord Chaitanya, give me shelter under his lotus feet? Mancha kalpa tarubhyascha kripa sindhubhyevacha patita anam pavanebhyo vaishnavebhyo namo namaha. I offer my respectful obeisances unto the direction of devotees of the Lord. They are just like desire trees and can fulfill the desires of everyone, and they are full of compassion for the fallen conditioned souls. 
Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shri Vasadi Gaura Bhakta Vrinda. I offer my respectful obeisances unto Shri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, Lord Nityananda, Shri Advaita, Gadadhar Pandit, Shri Vastakur, and all the devotees of Lord Chaitanya. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Rama Hare Hare. I pray that Shri Shri Radha Kalachanji, Shri La Prabhupada, and Shri La Guru, they have used me as an instrument so that their message can flow through me to give me the words to serve the Vaishnavas listening. So as I said, we're reading from Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 2, The Cosmic Manifestation, Chapter 6, Purusha Shukta Confirmed, Text 11. Avyakta rasa sindunam. Bhutanam nidhana shacha. Udaram viditam pumso. Hridayam manasa padam. Please chant. Avyakta rasa sindunam. Bhutanam nidhana shacha. Udaram Viditam Pumso Hidayam Manasapadam Avyakta Rasa Sindunam Bhutanam Nidanashacha Udaram Viditam Pumso Hidayam Manasapadam Avakya, the impersonal feature. Rasa Sindunam, of the seas and oceans of water. Bhutanam, of those who take birth in the material world. Nidhanasya, of the annihilation. Cha, also. Udaram, his belly, Viditam, is known by the intelligent class of men. Bhumsaha, of the great personality. Hridayam, the heart. Manasaha, of the subtle body. Padam, the place. Translation and purport by His Divine Grace A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Srila Prabhupada. The impersonal feature of the Lord is the abode of great oceans, and his belly is the resting place for the materially annihilated living entities. His heart is the abode of the subtle material bodies of living beings. Thus, it is known by the intelligent class of men. Purport. In the Bhagavad Gita 8.17-18, to 18, it is stated that according to human calculations, one day of Brahma is equal to 1,000 ages of four millenniums, 4,300,000 years each. And the same period is calculated to be his night also. A Brahma lives for 100 such years and then dies. Brahma, who is generally a great devotee of the Lord, attains liberation after such a downfall. The universe called the Brahmanda, or the round football-like domain controlled by a Brahma, is thus annihilated. And thus, the inhabitants of a particular planet or of the whole universe are also annihilated. Avyakta, mentioned here in this verse, means the night of Brahma, when partial annihilation takes place and the living entities of that particular Brahmanda up to the planets of Brahmaloka, along with the big oceans, etc., all repose in the belly of the Virat Purusha. At the end of Brahma's night, the creation again takes place, and the living entities reserved within the belly of the Lord are let loose to play their respective parts as if being awakened from a deep slumber. Since the living entities are never destroyed, the annihilation of the material world does not annihilate the existence of the living entities, but until liberation is attained, one has to accept one material body after another, again and again. The human life is meant for making a solution to this repeated change of bodies and thereby attaining a peace in the spiritual sky, where everything is eternal, blissful, and full of knowledge. 
In other words, the subtle forms of the living entities take place in the heart of the supreme being, and such forms take tangible shape at the time of creation. So I'll read text 11 again. The impersonal feature of the Lord is the abode of great oceans, and his belly is the resting place for the materially annihilated living entities. His heart is the abode of the subtle material bodies of living beings. Thus it is known by the intelligent class of men. 12. Also, the consciousness of the great personality is the abode of religious principles, mine, yours, and those of the four bachelors, Sanaka, Sanatan, Sanatan, Sanat Kumara, and Sananda, Sanandanda. The consciousness is also the abode of truth and transcendental knowledge. Texts 13 through 16. Beginning from me, Brahma, down to you, and Pava, Shiva, all the great sages who were born before you, the demigods, the demons, the nagas, the human beings, the birds, the beasts, as well as reptiles, and all phenomenal manifestations of the universes, namely the planets, stars, asteroids, luminaries, lightning, thunder, and the inhabitants of the different planetary systems, namely the Gandharvas, Apsaras, Yakshas, Rakshas, uh, Bhutanganas, Uragas, Pashus, Pitas, Siddhas, Vidyadharas, Sharanas, and all other different varieties of living entities, including the birds, beasts, trees, and everything that be, are all covered by the universal form of the Lord at all times, namely past, present, and future, although he is transcendental to all of them, eternally existing in a form not exceeding nine inches. So we are continuing our description of the Virat um, Rup um, with Lord Brahma um, speaking. And he's, we learn all the different aspects of how the universal form correlates with all the things that we see. We've learned that like the rivers and um, oceans are his veins and the trees are like the hairs on his body. Um, so it all gives us a way to visualize this great grand form of God, um, but also to help us realize that God is personal and that we um, have a personal relationship to God. So here it's describing um, what happens at the time of annihilation, or, you know, so we have the time of creation, but we also have the time of annihilation. And it happens um, at the end of Brahma's life, but at the end of each day, there's a mini annihilation, it says. And at that time, um, all the living entities that are still in the material world are, I guess, given shelter in the belly of this Virat Rup this universal form of Krishna, of God. And then when creation is, again, renewed, then the material entities take on their different um, forms, the different bodies they're going to inhabit, as, in, as it says, like the birds, beasts, trees, and everything else. So we learn about this so that we can have an understanding of of um, who we are, where we come from, and where, um, what our purpose is. So if we look at this, you know, we're, it talk, Srila Prabhupada says in his purport that um, human life is meant for making a solution to this repeated change of bodies and thereby attaining a place in the spiritual sky. So that's what we're trying to do is figure out what is our personal relationship to God and then um, reconnect ourselves to God. And that way we can attain our place in the spiritual sky. So we have a few things that we do in order to re-imagine um, or reconnect ourselves to God. Um, does anyone want to share what um, they think or what, you know, some thoughts you have about what it is that we can do to reconnect ourselves to Krishna? Thank you. Well, 
By doing devotional service. Wonderful. Um, by doing devotional service, is there a type of devotional service that you really enjoy doing? Chanting the holy name. That's wonderful. And um, when you chant the holy names, is there um, a certain way that you feel? Does it make you think of certain things? Holy name, we need to think of Krishna. Closer. Bring it closer. You need to chant. To, you need to think of Krishna when you chant the holy name. So you think of Krishna when you chant the holy names. It's beautiful, excellent. Um, yes, that's an excellent way of rendering service to Krishna and reigniting our relationship to Krishna to God. Um, I always equate chanting the holy names as having like a play date with Krishna at that moment, right? Um, or a lunch date, or breakfast date, whatever time of day that we're chanting. Um, we want to imagine that Krishna is right there with us, right? So sometimes we can think that, oh, you know, we're chanting, and it, it can seem so abstract that Krishna is there. So um, we can let our minds wander. Sometimes we... Um, I don't know, play on our phones, scroll Facebook, you know, talk to other people, watch TV. But every time, sometimes I find myself engaging in that, I try to think of like, wait a minute, if I was hanging out with a friend of mine, and then like as the middle of us talking, I pull out my phone and I start scrolling, or, you know, I'm, they're talking and I just turn on the TV or I start talking to someone else, you know, it's very rude. Or if they were to do that to me, it's like, okay, why am I here? You know, if you're just going to be on your phone, then I don't need to be here. And if we can imagine that Krishna can sometimes feel that same way, then we can focus a little bit better on that relationship that we have. So what are some ways that we can really focus that Krishna is there when we're chanting? Any thoughts? Microphone, please. If we try to uh, be more attentive in his holy name, non-different. We have to feel uh, Krishna is non-different than him. Right. So we want to be very attentive in our whole enchanting of the holy names and feeling that Krishna is non-different than him. How do you do that? Bring it closer. There's people listening online, and they won't hear you. Okay. Now, now it's okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, how we feel means uh, I feel you know we are uh, we are part and parcel of Krishna because we are not related to in this material world, and then we are his part and parcel. And we can really connect with him only. Otherwise, we cannot connect with anything here. It's right. our Thank you for sharing. Yes. I know there are um, many workshops on this, and I did it. I attend a couple, and there are many books written. I think Gira Swami wrote a book on this, but and Sachinandana Swami does a workshop every year in Govardhan. So I think there are many techniques, but a couple that I've heard. Um, one is uh, to put a picture of Krishna in front of you or sit in front of the deities so that as you're chanting, you are gazing at him and so it gives your mind that visual as you repeat his name over and over um, i have found it helpful to uh, sit with other people while i chant just being in the company of others so then you know you're not going to pull out your phone in front of somebody else uh, hopefully that person would chastise you um, so being with other devotees who are sitting and chanting and it kind of gets me in the mood of okay this is this is the name this is krishna this is krishna's time Thank you for sharing. Anyone else have any? Um, yes. Hi, Krishna Mataji. Hi, Krishna. I had heard this from Mataji from Chopati Temple. And she said that. Closer. I had heard this. Yeah, yeah that was good. Oh, okay. Uh, a Mataji from Chopati Temple had shared this, that uh, when, I, when, I, when I chant the Mahamantra for the very first time in the morning, 
it's like she feels that okay i have called krishna and now he's sitting next to me so now i don't want him to go i don't want to deviate so that's how that's how then i try to focus on what i am chanting and what i'm saying and how i am saying his names am i doing it properly am i doing it with all the love and affection exactly thank you um so there's so many different tricks or tips or things that we can do to really help us focus on our relationship to Krishna while we're chanting um some of the things like again I've attended you know Satchinanda Swami's um workshops at New at New Vrindavan as well as Giriraj Maharaj's and Ramapad Swami's workshops and you know there's so many different things that we can do to focus um you know the I think sometimes it's really good to engage all of our senses. So if we light like incense then we engage our sense of smell. Like you said if we have a picture then we engage our, you know, sense of sight. And then when we're chanting on the beads we engage our touch and then we're engaging hopefully we're engaging our sense of hearing and speaking, right? That's the whole point. Sometimes even without the phone, even in the company of others, our mind can wander. Um so what we want to do is you know when it wanders we want to focus back in on what the chanting and really focusing on like okay this is my time with krishna and i feel that or i see that one of the things that we can do to help really reconnect and um focus during japa is reading right if we read at some point during the day we're learning about his past times we're learning about who he is what he likes what he does um who he associates with all of these things that while we're chanting our mind is naturally like it's you know so out of control it's just going to wander but if then if we give it something to focus on like oh remember this story of you know krishna lifting govardhan um or krishna dancing with the gopis or you know eating um with his friends if we remember these different past times um then also we can focus we're still thinking of krishna and then it helps us to focus a little more um for sure i think one of the big things is i found that helps me is also leaving my phone in another room that way there's not even the temptation to pick it up um sometimes i share that i like to go for walks because again sometimes being in the house i see oh look there's a mess there let me clean it up and before i know it i'm chanting and cleaning which is not really chanting i guess um you know so it's like there's always something like i used to think okay let me make sure in the morning at, at night i would make sure okay is there anything in the morning that will distract me and the mind is such that i will find something even if i clean up everything the night before and make it really nice and then i come in in the morning and i'm like oh look that you know because when you're chanting we're so um conditioned to that our mind is not focused um so you know there's a little things like that i think it's important also not just to read about krishna but to read these books that our teachers have written on how to chant properly burijan prabhu has a really great book um mahatma prabhu also has um a really nice book of like japa affirmations which is really great so sometimes um before i chant i pick up his book and flip it randomly and have that meditation the affirmation that he gives like my favorite one is i want to chant i get to chant i love to chant right and so sometimes we have this like oh my god i have to chant my rounds or you know i have this and so when you approach your japa with this met mean of like oh my god this is something i have to do you're already like you know not into it so if we come up with like oh i want to chant i get to chant you know i love to chant then our mind starts to think oh this is something we really enjoy doing let's focus on it you know when we are doing something that's very materialistically pleasurable we don't really have to do all these things to make our cells focus right like if we're watching a movie especially if it's a really good movie like 
I don't find myself picking up the phone. I don't find myself thinking of other things, talking to other people. I feel myself like watching the movie and engage like, oh my God, what's going to happen? You know, you get really caught up in it. And it's not like, oh my God, I have to finish watching this movie. It's such a chore. But that's how we approach our job. Like it's this big chore. Um, so we want to change that mindset. And sometimes we first trick ourselves into doing it, right? We trick our mind like, oh, this is something we want to do. And the beauty of our mind is it's easily gullible. It's very mm -hmm. trickable like that, right? Um, they say like you can imagine that you like drink water and you imagine the taste and then it almost quenches your thirst because that's how the mind is. The mind is easily fooled. Um, there's so many studies that show that like the mind can't really tell the difference between when you're imagining something or if something's real. So if you have this like fear of something happening and you start thinking about, oh my God, what if this were to happen? What if I were to be chased by a tiger? Your body, your mind automatically releases the signals for your body to release those chemicals for fight or flight. And, you know, you go through this whole response and all you're doing is thinking about your own fears and your body's already responding to it as if it didn't happen or as if it actually happened. And so in that same way, we can train ourselves to trick our minds into enjoying something, and then we actually enjoy it, right? And in the Bhagavad Gita, it says that um, those in the mode of goodness, things that are, you know, initially, like, difficult or poisonous actually become nectar. And I know that in my own life, non-spiritual life, I found that to be in so many things, right? Like, when you start to eat healthier, um, I remember at first I really didn't enjoy, or I really had like a big attachment to um, like white bread type stuff or like pretzels, like the kind things like that. And then I was like, okay, I need to eat more whole grains, and I switched over to eating like the whole grain bread or sprouted grain bread or even like you know homemade type breads. And they're a little heartier. They're not as like soft and sweet as the white breads that you can buy. And eventually, I got to the point where I really enjoy that kind of bread. And the, like the last time I had that white pretzel, like the white flour, I was like, oh, how could I have ever liked this? This doesn't even taste good. And so I saw that my, ch my sh taste shifted according to the habits that I formed, right? So I formed this habit of eating healthier that I actually now like, like that better. And, and I just, you know, last, lost my taste for something that was not as good for me. Mm -hmm. So it's the same way when it comes to chanting for any of our devotional services. Sometimes, you know, sometimes we are lucky enough to be engaged in a devotional service that we love to do and we find fulfilling and that, you know, we um, are serving Krishna, like we can see how we're serving Krishna. And other times we're engaged in devotional service that seems a little bit more indirect and it can be harder to engage ourselves. But if we remind ourselves that we are actually doing devotional service and this is how and this is what I'm doing. For instance, when I was working um, and really did not like my job and I didn't like, my, you know, like the bosses and the way they were treating me and all this stuff, but it was really difficult. And I would have to remind myself that I'm doing this because I'm maintaining myself. I'm able to donate money. Um, I've even shared this where um, I was so distraught. And I, like, was dressing the deities. And I was asking them, like, what do I have to, what do I, what do I need to do? I don't understand what to do because... This job is very difficult, and I'm working long hours, and you know, barely getting chant time to chant, barely getting time to associate. And I really like, I don't know what I was expecting. And the message I got at that moment was like, Krishna told me like, okay, you're going to continue this job, but I'm going to give you my association by giving you an extra day of of dressing me in the morning. So at first. Like, when that opportunity arose, I was like, what? Like, how am I going to handle another morning of dressing the deities, getting up early, and then having to rush to work? And somehow or another, it just worked out. And by doing that, it 
It gave me the strength, right? And then there were so many different things that came up that was like, Krishna, it was reinforcing Krishna's message to me that I needed to continue working at this job. And one of them was like, um, the donations that I was giving, I got this major recognition, and I was like, oh, you know, I'm working really hard, but there is some benefit, not just to me and my material, you know, existence, um, but there was also benefit to, you know, the, the, the organizations, the, thing, the people that I was donating to, um, and then there was a few other messages that I'd gotten from Krishna that said, like, continue. So then everything pacified for a while, and like probably six to eight months later, things started flaring up again at work. And I was like, okay, wow, I don't know how much longer I can take this. And it was really interesting to me because, again, when I went in front of the deities and I was like, I don't know what to do, this time the message was the opposite. It was like, you need to quit your job. You need to pursue something else. And it was really interesting to me that in that slight six months like what changed well it was some financial thing right because if I'd quit six months earlier I would have had to pay back some of the bonuses um, but because I quit six months later not only did I not have to pay back the bonuses but I hit another bonus and then like you know I was able to quit work not work for like four and a half years because of that extra money and it's just like Krishna always looks out for you, no matter what, right? So I think of this as our reciprocation. We don't, like, this is kind of a material slash spiritual reciprocation, but there's so many ways that Krishna reciprocates in our lives every single day. And if we remember these things, then um, our connection to Krishna grows even stronger. So one of the things that I had to do when I was like working, it was the same thing that during that time period where Krishna was like, no, you have to continue. I used to have to get up and I'd start to go, oh God, I have to go to work. And then I'd be like, no, no, no. I get to go to work. I want to go to work. I love to go to work, right? So I started to trick my mind into believing that. But I also started to chant in the, like at least four rounds in the morning before going to work, if not more. Mm -hmm. And that made a difference as well, right? It helps mm -hmm. keep you calm and feeling good. So um, I'll ask another question. What are some ways that you found that Krishna has reciprocated in your life that has helped you to stay, like, you know, faithful to chanting, faithful to on the path of Krishna consciousness? Thank you, Mataji. It's, uh, I feel, you know, uh, it's so nice your realization about how I was uh, just thinking, you know, sometimes you, you think uh, Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, it's very difficult to mold the mind. Mind is very strong, yes. But you were, you were saying uh, the, we can convince the mind the slowly, slowly. It's, it's easy, difficult when it is... Uh, it's, it is already swept up. It means it already is so attached to something, contemplating in something. In that situation, mm, to bring the uh, uh, the our own way, it's very difficult. But you know, slowly we make positive, positive, positive. We tell him the good things again and again and again. The mind will be convinced. <laughs> I was so. Uh, I really like the point because sometimes I feel you know I. Discourage so much, maybe there is no other way. <laughs> there is no way I can make it, you know. But it uh, gave me a lot of hope. Thank you. And uh, Krishna, I feel, you know, he reciprocates uh, to the devotee in every situation. I feel in uh, my life, I don't know how I could be living, you know, without Krishna. I feel every moment, I feel... Um, Krishna's uh, uh, mercy, and then sometimes so oh, many bad things also happen in our life, and then we start 
um, uh, means uh, feel we feel uh, maybe doubting with Krishna or uh, we maybe uh, saying we may don't put so much of faith in Krishna and slowly, slowly, you know, in that situation, somehow other we manage devotee are there. I know we have difficult difficulty time. We just be in the devotee, devotee association here, Krishna Katha, Srimad Bhagavatam, read a uh, Prabhupada book, and slowly, slowly we can realize after some time, I feel that is what was happening and the before um, for my good, you know. Means I got, I get purified so much in that situation. I connected, I get more connected with Krishna, and now my relationship with Krishna is more close. You know, I feel like even the difficulty situation also it comes. Uh, uh, in the beginning, it was very hard to tolerate, but now the even the difficulty situation is coming. I feel yeah, Krishna may have some plan. You know, and in every situation, I particularly I cannot share, but every situation I I am very grateful with Krishna, Mataji. He is giving so much to us. Thank you for sharing. Does anyone else want to share? I I don't know that I have anything as um, concrete as what you have shared so wonderfully, where you really were asking for help and your heart was open enough that you could really hear the answer to to those moments kind of you sounded very much like Arjuna so confused and what do I do and you really accepted those answers whether you you wanted those answers or not so I don't know if I have anything that concrete but when I look at my life I feel that the people who are in my life are Chris is Krishna's reciprocation with me um, you know, I, I did not grow up in ISKCON. I came to the movement on my own, and everybody was very encouraging to me, and I ended up meeting a very wonderful man who became my husband, who is very um, who had been in ISKCON for like 20 years before I even met him, and he's helped me grow, and finding my Guru Maharaj, who has given me so much love and attention. So, um, and that is what has kept me chanting and has kept me following the regular principles is... Um, I feel a little emotional just how much um, I love my Guru Maharaj. Just, I can always, anytime I have a hard day, I can just think of his face and I think, you know, well, I'm not going to let, I'm not going to let him down. So um, that is what has kept me, I think, is those relationships that I have found in Krishna consciousness. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, our relationships are very important in Krishna consciousness. Um, and they can keep us strong. And it's important to have those different relationships, right? We have our spiritual teachers. Um, we also have um, mentors, right? So we have Shiksha Gurus and Diksha Gurus. Um, we also have peers. And I think our peer association is also extremely important, right? Because as much as we um, love and honor our spiritual master, you can't just call them up and be like, oh my God, I had the worst day, right? Like we need peers to be able to do that. And then hopefully we have peers that are intelligent enough to keep us, you know, on this path because sometimes we can vent and we can express doubt. And if we have a, a peer or, a, you know, friend that we're expressing doubt to and they're like minimizing our doubt or, you know, judging us for our doubt, it helps it becomes very difficult for us to share um, any doubts or challenges that we're having. Whereas if we have friends that listen and empathize and understand like this material world is full of so much, like not just misery, but also pleasure and confusion. And we're so conditioned and attached to our sense senses and the gratification that we can get that it's, you know, it's like a fine line, and a good friend can help keep us on this the line of Krishna consciousness. So, as well as surrounding ourselves with the words and writings of our spiritual teachers, right? I know that when I listen to lectures from my spiritual teacher regularly, I feel so much more connected and fixed that the doubts are not as um, important. They're not playing a big role in my decisions and what I'm doing. 
um, actually they can kind of really go away. I know that oftentimes when I'm wrestling with something, a dilemma, that somehow or another I put on a, a lecture from my spiritual teacher and he answers the dilemma. Like, it just happens. I don't know how that happens. It's, you know, I see that as like my spiritual teacher stepping into divine intervention. But every single time I'm like, I'm wrestling with something and I listen to a lecture and he answers it like as if he was talking to me personally. Um, so that I find is a great way also that helps strengthen my japa, right? So that somehow that became our topic today of how to strengthen our japa. And I, I was sitting here reflecting about that, and I remember hearing several times from great spiritual teachers that oftentimes when we're sitting up here on the Vyasasan and giving class, what we end up talking about is something that we need to hear more than anyone else in the room needs to hear. So I was thinking about that. I was like, yeah, you know, I have kind of let loose a little bit on on being attentive in my job. And I think this is a really good, um, you know, class for me because I'm hearing all these ideas that y'all are sharing and, and then reminding myself of things that have helped me as well. So um, I'll open the floor for any last questions, thoughts, realizations, anything that's there. Um, I was just thinking about uh, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Maharaj. Uh, mostly when I chant, before I like to read, I means before day only, I just want to connect some of the point about chanting. Just like Bhakti Vinod Thakur's uh, quote, or Shila Prabhupada's quote, or Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Maharaj's quote. And Maharaj, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Maharaj was saying, just like you, you first of all, you connect, feel, feel to Krishna, and then we'll chant. And Krishna is, I am yours. And after that, uh, we think about uh, and this chanting mala is like Mahaprabhu's with Ananda Prabhu's and um, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's lotus feet. And I'm tossing, I'm tossing uh, his lotus feet. And then, um, and, and mostly I just uh, chant little loud. If my mind is disturbed, I like to yell, you know, sometimes. <laughs> Hare Krishna, big sound. At home, it's uh, possible. Yeah. If I'm alone, possible. I can make a big, big sound. <laughs> and just uh, so that in the beginning, uh, sometimes it's very difficult to focus our the before days. You, you were sharing also, if we read properly Srimad Bhagavatam, mostly if I read the Bhagavatam, it's very easy to connect for me to chanting tomorrow morning. But uh, sometimes my mind is going here and there are so many family matters. And morning, in the beginning, chanting was very difficult. And then I uh, sometimes make a big, big sound, at least three, four rounds. And then slowly I connect and I observe. And then the flow can go continuously like that. Thank you, Matiji. All right. Thank you for sharing. So, oh, go ahead. just want to say one thing. I remember my um, my Guru Raj said once in a lecture that uh, japa is the hardest for us and that japa is preparing us for the time of death. Because in kirtan, it's, I'm paraphrasing this part, it's all fun and games. You know, you have the rhythm and you have your friends and it's kind of a party. But japa is just you and your mind. And that's what it will be like when you leave your body. So the more that you can concentrate and connect with Krishna alone in just that sound uh, will will help you uh, at the end. Thank you. So that um, reminds me, I'll end with this um, analogy that I like to make as well, right? As a extremely uh, extrovert and social person that, you know, when you're at a party, it's you meet different people and you connect with different people and you, it's not, it's a great fun time, but it's not really a time where you like really get to know someone, right? And I feel like Kirtan is like that. It's like a fun party where you're, you know, just having fun. You're superficially getting to know Krishna, but not like that deep and meaningful. 
sometimes if you really hit it off with someone at a party, you're like, hey, let's hang out, right? And then you get to know them more deeply, more personally. And that's what Japa is, right? It's the party after the party. Like when you sit and you're just like, stay up all night talking to someone and getting to know them and they get to know you and you're sharing your hopes, fears, and dreams. And um, that's what Japa is, right? Like we can't have that deep personal connection in a party, but we can do it on a more individual, personal basis. And, you know, like I said, if we imagine every time we chant Japa that Krishna's sitting right there, you know, like they say, oh, he's dancing on our tongue. But, I mean, realistically speaking, I don't, I don't visualize that. That's just like a, something that we're supposed to think of. But if I'm sitting there thinking of Krishna sitting right there next to me, you know, and I'm talking to him with, through my japa, like I'm talking to him, then it's a little bit easier to, like, understand this personal connection. So um, my challenge, I guess, for the week is at least one or two rounds, if we can imagine that Krishna's sitting with us and, you know, really focusing during those one or two rounds that we can, um, even that can make such a great difference in our rest of our japa and the rest of our day and how we engage and think of Krishna and do our devotional service to him. So, thank you. Sarantara Srimad Bhagavatam Ki.
Thank you. 